Veracruz Mex, Cartagena, London Gateway. This encrypted message dated November 10th, 2015, comes from Fritz, which is actually the nickname of Bridgen and B. This message provides a list of ports which are planned for the transit of the next Coke shipment. The shipping route for the container is finally approved by the notorious Dutch Kingpin, who during the discussion called himself the Bold, in reference to Roger P, alias Pete Costa. From Puerto Moyne to Cartagena, then to Portugal, then to Belgium, that's the plan. Okay, it's not a bad route. It's something different for once, mate. Thus, more than a ton of this precious powder is on its way to the port of Antwerp in Belgium, under the control of Pete Costa, a legendary figure in this underworld. All those who have dealt with him have prospered, including Naima Jilal, often nicknamed the Godmother of Coke. It is also within the context of this police investigation that her name will be mentioned for the first time. It is essential to understand that the Rotterdam network, led by Pete Costa, does not directly involve itself in the operations and prefers to subcontract the work to actors who remain closely connected to the supply chain. This structure creates a vast spider's web made up of different units capable of operating autonomously. One of these units is run by an Antwerp resident called Sadik ELA. He occupies a truly executive position and supervises a duo of entrepreneurs, Thomas and Florian, the latter being a former stock trader who was even considered, at the time, to be the Dutch Wolf of Wall Street. This tandem set out to create specialist companies, mainly in the fruit trade, which serve as cover for the imported coke from South America in their containers. The two entrepreneurs run a company called DGTC, which is operating at full capacity throughout 2015. They buy and import bananas from Colombia, which they then introduce onto the Dutch market. To find customers for their fruit, it seems they even placed ads on the internet, on a sales site. Florian even sent an email to his partner Thomas mentioning the generated profits. Not bad for two guys who have nothing to do with bananas and who have only been there for two months and this is just the beginning. All their actions are aimed primarily at disguising the illegal nature of their activities and making them appear legitimate. This is how they create a large number of businesses, placing trusted acquaintances at the helm of each of them, at least that's what's recorded on paper. In reality, everything remains under the direct control of the duo, in particular Thomas, who holds the details of all the bank accounts of six companies involved in the smuggling operation. The management of these numerous companies even confused one of their customers. It has been revealed that on the labels of the cartons of bananas received, it was not the name of the company DGTC that appeared, but that of another company that we will call X. In practice, the DGTC sold bananas in the Netherlands that it did not import itself while Company X did. After the customer pointed this out to one of the two partners, Florian sent an explanatory email. We have an agreement with Company X that we will handle all shipments for them. You will receive an invoice from DGTC as agreed. Best regards, Florian. So far, nothing illegal, as the duo are busy running a business importing fruit in containers. However, according to the courts, this is merely a cover for Sadik's activities. Indeed, the latter, a Belgian-Moroccan national, controls the business of Company X, which manages the financing of shipments of bananas that must, of course, be accompanied by large quantities of cocaine. To stay in the shadows, he calls on the services of Thomas and Florian, who cooperate fully. For example, when Company X needs cash in its bank account to place orders with fruit suppliers in Colombia and cover transportation costs in June 2015, it is indeed Thomas who deposits large sums of cash there. Shortly afterwards, in July of the same year, more than four tons of the white powder are discovered in the middle of bananas in two shipments destined for Company X in the port of Antwerp. Once their mission is accomplished with the bananas, the two accomplices do not linger on the same commercial line and immediately move on to other things. The group uses exactly the same method with other companies. 
For instance, in another case related to pineapple shipments from Panama, a new company is established in Germany, with the need to deposit significant amounts of cash into the accounts once again. Quite surprisingly, the suspects don't seem to attach any importance to the sale of the delivered fruits. In the case of pineapples, they don't even appear concerned about the retrieval of several shipments of these fruits at the port. And when they do, in part, they store them in a non-refrigerated warehouse in Germany, resulting in a significant loss of quality, forcing them to sell the fruits at a loss. The police investigation at that time encompasses numerous cases related to this trio, but what interests us the most is the case related to pineapple juice from Costa Rica, where Pete Costa, who pulls the strings behind the scenes, finally appears. While the unit led by Sadiq manages companies specializing in the fruit trade, the Rotterdam network takes advantage of their service to introduce drugs into these shipments. As mentioned earlier, Pete Costa has a discussion with Fritz regarding the delivery of coke from Puerto Moyne, Costa Rica, to Antwerp, Belgium, scheduled for the Christmas period. Next week, I'm going to know everything, and I'm going to do it right now. I've got to get them into these barrels, yeah? Can you send me a photo with all the dimensions so I can organize these barrels in advance and work quickly? Okay, buddy, I'll take care of it. No, it's not barrels, it's dried pulp that goes into a kind of big bag, and it's dry. I'll organize and send all the information. What should I offer the company? My friend, the fewer the better, and as far as the company's concerned, it's up to you. All right, mate. That's fine. Indeed, it's the pineapple juice with pulp, and Pete Costa ultimately gives the green light for this delivery. The first step for the Rotterdam network is to delegate to Sadik's team the creation of cover companies that could allow coke to be imported under cover of fruit. The second stage of this mission linked to pineapple juice involves managing the logistics in the port of Antwerp and collecting the cargo while avoiding customs checks. That's why a new unit consisting of Murat and Mikhail has been hired. It is important to note that at this stage, an anonymous tip-off reaches the criminal intelligence team, the TCI, indicating that this duo are preparing to import coke from South America and that they are approaching people working in the ports to ask for their help, in other words, either to bribe them. Unsurprisingly, a police investigation is launched, placing the suspects under surveillance. In October 2015, it is discovered that they are planning to recruit various individuals, including someone working at customs. There's another guy over there, and I know this guy, do you understand? I've known him since elementary school. He also tells Mikhail about another friend who works in the port. There's another guy too. He works at customs. Let me talk to him. I can include him, but I don't know exactly what his job is. In any case, the duo also need a driver to collect the goods, which are due to arrive in the port of Antwerp towards the end of the year. The contact with this driver, whom we will call Antwerp Driver, was established thanks to Mikhail. He had previously approached him in a parking lot where he always parked his truck, offering to pick up a shipment for a company he worked for. The contact will last, ideally useful for the next delivery. In short, several units work independently, and the pawns within these units don't even know who their bosses are. In October, Murat makes it clear to his colleague Mikhail that they now have a golden opportunity in their hands and that they have to be extremely careful not to let it slip through their fingers. We can't give up and we're going to keep on fighting. Yeah, that's it. We're just going to keep going right to the end. They are contacted by an acquaintance who explains to them that they should demonstrate a little more patience and prove their reliability by bringing some money to secure a meeting with the leaders as evidenced by a phone conversation between the two members a few weeks later. Yeah, man. What are these guys saying? Are they crazy? Why is that? What does he want? Is he asking for a deposit? Yeah. 50K? Yeah, it'll be ready on Tuesday. What? 50,000? Yeah. 
and we have to give them all this? No, I've arranged for something else, like meeting somewhere, for example at your place, and then his contact will come, someone who knows these guys. He'll see the 50k, and then we can go to a car on the side to see and talk to these guys. He can bl me, ha <laughs> ha, he's crazy. 50k, what a deposit for a meeting. Yeah, but hey, the meeting's Tuesday night, let's do this right, man. The need to bring money as a guarantee clearly demonstrates their subordinate status compared to the network's leaders. Yeah. And what? There's already a message from those bastards in Rotterdam. Uh, last time they said they were going to send a message this week, but so far nothing. All this upsets Mikhail, who is responsible for implementing the plan and recruiting the workforce. Otherwise, I'm going to make them understand, you see. Because if I have nothing, then no one has anything, you see. Because I know enough about them, because they really do some dirty tricks. Sorry to put it that way, but it's not okay. First, we set something in motion. I give it my all, day and night, to organize something. And then suddenly you're told to come up with 50,000 euros just like that. Now our guys are just waiting all day and, well, what's going to happen? Do they want to work or not? We drew up a plan for nothing. After many disputes, it finally seems that they have agreed on the mission, as evidenced by a message from a member of the Rotterdam network. We're almost ready. There'll be a 100% party at Christmas. I give you a guarantee. At the end of November, the police observe Mikhail during a meeting at a restaurant in Rotterdam. One day later, he calls his teammate, he is offering 300k. He should double that, brother. No, no, he refused. At first he even said 200k and I said goodbye, to which he replied, do whatever you want. Okay, so now that the plan is in place, the shipment is on its way to the port of Antwerp with a cargo of over a ton of coke, valued at over 30 million euros. A nice Christmas gift for some. The last step that remains to be organized is to find a storage location where the truck will leave the cargo after delivery. For this mission, Sadik from the other unit orders Thomas to organize everything, which eventually leads to the rental of the warehouse in Ramstongsveer, the Netherlands. The team is therefore ready for action on 21st December 2015. The Antwerp driver, having received the container number from Mikhail, went to work at around 7.30 a.m. There, he searches through a stack of documents to find the correct container number, including all the necessary data, including the access PIN code. At around 8 o'clock in the morning, before heading for Antwerp, he plans to make a brief stop in a parking lot. I'm on my way now. I'm on this road too. Wait here. Aren't you there yet? In five minutes. Once there, Another accomplice boards the truck as co-driver to accompany the Antwerp driver. On arrival at the port, he goes to a company where he enters his name, the container number and the PIN code allocated. Once he's out, he heads to the gate where he has to wait until the container is loaded onto his trailer before he can leave for the same parking lot near the port. There, a second team is waiting for him with another truck. Antwerp driver then disconnects its black trailer and swaps it with the trailer of the second truck. The co-driver then joins the driver of this second truck, and both of them depart with the cargo towards the warehouse. At this point, Antwerp driver is rather annoyed, because the trailer he has received is not the same color as his own, and he insults Mikhail. I'm really going to kill you f***ing shit, man. Man, just make sure I get my trailer back in an hour. It is worth noting that throughout this process, Sadik oversees the operations, occasionally appearing around the truck. Finally, the truck arrives at the Ramsdongsphere warehouse. Shortly thereafter, as various accomplices take charge of unloading the cargo from the container, the police raid the scene and discover the coke hidden among the pineapple juice. In the afternoon, the Antwerp driver tries to contact Mikhail and others to find out where his trailer was but gets no reply. Hey, where are you? I really need this trailer. Where are you? 
I'll find you, my friend. Mark my words. At this point, Mikhail and Murat are on their way to Rotterdam, and they are discussing what has just happened. Do you know what you should do now? We need to ensure that the driver doesn't reveal he was driving the shipment. For now, we have to avoid any connection as much as possible. Uh, we don't know for sure. His name might show up at the port, right? You're crazy, man. He still has to show his ID, though, right? What should we do now? How many people do you think got arrested? Three, or at least four, I think. Apparently, the network is afraid that the Antwerp driver could be connected to the container, and this possible connection must be avoided at all costs. However, it's too late because he's registered to pick up the cargo, and his name is all over the place. That same evening, Mikhail told Murat that the money should arrive for them tomorrow, because the guy from Rotterdam had contacted him. The other guy asked my friend what time tomorrow. If it's for the money, then it's good in the morning. He asked me, what do you want? A lot of money or a little money? Really, man, he said that to me. It would be nice if it was 300,000 euros. It's good around four to five o'clock. You know what I was thinking? I swear, I wanted to offer you 60% of that 300K. That's what I wanted to offer you myself. 40%, 60%. Yes. However, they can forget about that amount after the major blow suffered by the network, and the police won't leave them alone from now on. As for the other unit, Sadiq orders Thomas to go take photos of the warehouse to see what's happening there. The latter sends a subordinate, who declares that everything is completely closed and sealed. Sadiq was finally arrested in June 2016, in a flat in Amsterdam. During the police raid, he attempts to access the neighbor's balcony before being captured. On the same balcony, a BlackBerry phone is found, cut in two, and the SD card is missing. On the same day, Sadik undergoes a scan that reveals the presence of a small object not quite natural inside his body. His feces are then examined by the police, confirming the presence of a micro SD memory card. So, for this case, he was ultimately sentenced to 13 years in prison. Regarding the Rotterdam network and the prominent role played by Pete Costa in this surprise discovery among the pineapple juice, it will take many more years of intensive investigation to bring him to justice. It is during these years that a new underground war emerges as new containers will be ordered, but this time for torture. It is important to note that there is one final element worth highlighting here. One of the suspects in the warehouse captured by the police claimed years later that Naima had played an important role in the whole affair. You asked me who I was in contact with about the hangar with a Moroccan woman. She gave me an assignment, nothing more. She gave me the keys. Her name was Naim or something like that. You're asking me who this woman is. All I know is that she's disappeared. I saw her on the Obsporing Versocht website. This suspect is indeed referring to the disappearance of Naima Jilal, as we will soon discover. Behind the scenes of the Dutch Coke Mafia, enigmatic figures such as Pete Costa and Moose are well known. However, Naima Jilal's ascent to the top is particularly intriguing, as she is one of the few women to do so. She is nicknamed the Godmother of Coke, having formed partnerships with these two bosses to take control of the supply chain, sealing her fate. It all starts with Pete Costa, one of the most influential figures in the Dutch Mafia, operating out of Rotterdam. According to rumors, anyone doing business with him becomes incredibly wealthy. He is known as a discreet businessman who avoids violence at all costs to avoid drawing the authorities' attention. This strategy allowed him to remain in the shadows for many years, which explains the little information available about him. After being arrested in 2005 for various offenses, including robberies, he diversified his activities to concentrate on more lucrative businesses as soon as he was released. From 2009 onwards, according to police data, he undertook numerous trips to South America, 
making new contacts in countries such as Chile, Panama, and Colombia. Eventually, he reportedly took up residence in Costa Rica, where he officially resided between 2015 and 2018, hence his nickname. His frequent travels between Europe and South America raised questions, but he reportedly told police that these trips were linked to family visits in connection with his girlfriend at the time, which provided him with an ideal cover to conceal his criminal activities. However, in the milieu, another reason for all these journeys soon emerges. According to the criminal intelligence team, the TCI, it is widely believed that Pete Costa owns several pineapple plantations in Costa Rica and is heavily involved in exporting coke to Europe. This information is particularly significant in the light of a previous police raid on a warehouse in which over a ton of white powder was discovered in the middle of a shipment of pineapple juice from Costa Rica, imported specifically for Pete Costa's network. Information from sources in Rotterdam also points in this direction, suggesting that Pete Costa operates in the Premier League of the drug trade. Notorious figures active in the same business all have links with him, including Samir, alias Scarface, who was once considered one of the biggest traffickers in Europe. Among other things, Pete Costa is said to have helped him solve logistical problems thanks to his expertise in the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam, enabling him to control the entire logistics chain. However, the collaboration seems to have been short-lived as the famous Scarface was eliminated in Spain in 2014. His heirs continue the partnership with Pete Costa, one of the network's allies being the Dutch-Moroccan Mustafa, alias Moose. Since then, his group has generated tens of millions of euros in profits. Much of this success can be attributed to the helping hand of Pete Costa. Thanks to him, Moose can lead the life of a star, full of luxury and fast cars. According to the courts, it appears that he will soon be investing, together with Pete Costa and his long-standing colleague Naima, in a new shipment due to arrive in the port of Rotterdam in June 2016. We're not talking about just any cargo, but contents worth an estimated 100 million euros. To achieve this, the network exploits numerous corrupt contacts spread throughout the supply chain. First of all, there is an accomplice whom we will call X, who is responsible for importing pineapples via a legal company. Then a second partner, whom we call Y, takes care of the sea transport, ensuring that the container arrives at its destination on time and in good condition. Finally, a third accomplice, whom we call Zed, is responsible for ensuring that the drugs are extracted from the container at the right time, before anyone notices anything suspicious. To make this new trade route between Costa Rica and Rotterdam operational, a sufficient number of containers of fruit will have to be transported over a period of several months. In the event of an inspection, this helps to demonstrate that there is nothing illegal about the product and to avoid being blacklisted, which would otherwise lead to more stringent customs controls in the future. Indeed, Individual X, who manages the import of the containers, spreading the purchase of 16 pineapple shipments over time, paves the way for this new shipping route. This represents a commercial risk of over 1 million euros for this fruit business alone. Indeed, in April 2016, Accomplice Y informs the team that the majority of the shipments arriving at the terminal are now green, which means that customs control won't be necessary. X adds that he's happy with the way things are going and suggests that if they can keep this up, they'll soon have a nice shipping line. In a message addressed to Mus in particular, Pete Costa mentions that the cargo should leave on 14th of May with an estimated arrival date of 30 May. It is interesting to note that, because Accomplice Y is able to monitor the containers in the systems and ensure transport, other criminals are able to take advantage of his services, which is somewhat displeasing to the Rotterdam network, which clearly forbids him to collaborate with the other person. Because if there's something in the containers for your other client, he'll go straight to prison. And that will ruin everything for us, especially for our containers. He also mentions that they have rules here, which you have to follow. But you know I'm risking everything and our business is so well organised. Months of preparation to add a new line with a new customs officer. The message is clear. 
He cannot collaborate with other people if he does not want to be caught. Pete is said to have told another accomplice about the particular importance of this case, as well as the existence of the corrupt customs officer who is supposed to be greenlighting the container. We're going to work 100%, so if the customs officer gets impatient, go and see him and give him a few hundred thousand euros. We can't lose this guy. The group therefore expects to receive delivery in the next few days. It was at this point that Pete Costa gets in touch with his accomplice Zed, who is specialized in extraction and gives him information about the packages that were to be found among the pineapples in one of the incoming containers. The court notes that the provided description perfectly matches what is in the cargo on its way to the port of Rotterdam. However, a problem arises upon arrival when it is discovered on May 30th that there is a blockade on the dock. Tensions escalate in the conversations, and Moose wants to know exactly what is happening, demanding explanations from Pete Costa. The same goes for another accomplice known by the nickname Opa Fritz, who holds a significant position within the Rotterdam underworld and is well known for his corruption services. Costa replies that he would make sure that all the corrupt people had been paid and that no mistakes had been made. In the end, Fritz is said to have understood from his own contact that there had been a tip-off at the last minute. Costa is not giving up and plans to send a team to recover the coke from the container during the night. However, it appears that the container is definitively blocked and sent for analysis. Unsurprisingly, the corrupt customs officer who was supposed to let the container through is going to be interrogated by Costa's network. Moose is aware that once the container has been scanned, it will detect everything, as they have already tested previously. F it looks really bad. Mus thinks they've fallen into a trap. With our old customs officer, this would never have happened, I know that. Still no answer from that customs officer, mate. Nobody. That brother drives me crazy. Put the pressure on these guys. They can't do this to us. The consequences of this shit are incalculable. Finally, another key figure enters the picture, referred to as the aunt in the encrypted messages, whom the police suspect of being Naima. She is surprised by the chaotic turn of events because a few days earlier, Fruit Importer X had informed her that everything seemed to be going well even though she had asked him to check the status of the delivery in the system. This contrasts sharply with Moose's message and raises questions. Hey, on, on our container, there's a blockage. It's unloaded and we can't get it back. It's a mess. These guys from P are scammers. They've got nothing and can't do anything. Now they're saying that someone tipped off these containers. We've been working on the route for four years, doing everything ourselves. And now there's a snitch. Those dirty bastards. According to the police, P refers to Pete Costa in this case. Naima seems to have lost trust and is upset about how things are unfolding, as she suggests to Moose on 31st May. We have just been seriously ripped off by Opa Fritz and his friends. Someone ratted us out to justice. He then adds, It involves a lot of money and long prison sentences, aren't? Costa Rica line should be thrown out, it's all broken now. It seems to indicate that this new line with Costa Rica is now unusable. In short, this is what can happen when you work with a new company and a new customs officer and the usual procedures are not followed. To protect himself, Moose informs Pete Costa that he has promised €250,000 to the individual from the company responsible for importing the fruit and that he will deny any connection with them in court. On the other hand, Naima tells Moose that she is going to discuss all these problems with Pete Costa. Listen, how can he go to bed when something goes wrong and he's responsible? It's not going well at all. P is still asleep, but I'm going to go and see him and explain it to him. We've really been seriously scammed and our P doesn't want to understand that. Ultimately, on the same day, Pete Costa clearly tells his friend Z, responsible for the extraction, to give up the mission as the container with nearly four tons of coke is confiscated. We're just going to keep going, mate. It's already a total of 10,000 kilos in the red. <sighs> I will pave the way for four and five, and let's go. It seems that this is not the first time that a shipment has been confiscated. However, this is not slowing down the network at all, which is already ready for the next two shipments. Naima, realizing that the mission had failed, 
probably because the police had been alerted, also sends a message to Costa. We are just about to start a new story. Fine. Ultimately, the message from Pete Costa, which concludes this story, is as follows. We should never have done anything in this company. As for the man nicknamed Opa Fritz, it's not surprising that his name was initially associated with the loss of the cargo, as he is often in direct contact with corrupt customs officials. In addition, his group is tasked with finding suitable companies to import the drugs. However, as it later became apparent, this was simply a misunderstanding, and he is not involved in this confiscation. Nevertheless, Fritz's case remains interesting, especially as a subsequent investigation called Dobricic will be opened. The investigation is triggered by anonymous reports from the criminal intelligence team, the TCI, indicating that Fritz has been involved in criminal activities for many years. This is in line with the secretly recorded discussion with a colleague of this Fritz. Few people have lasted as long as we have. Very few. Each group works once or twice, then it's over. It is important to understand that the courts consider Fritz to be a coordinator who benefits from his vast network of corrupt contacts within the port of Rotterdam. He is also seen as a co-investor in various drug shipments. What's more, he regularly calls on the services of an employee of the tax authorities to identify companies likely to be importing coke. His group does not hesitate at all to bribe employees, as conversations show, with amounts of up to 2 million being mentioned for customs officers and 500,000 euros for the company. Fritz's group specializes mainly in the extraction of drugs from the port while avoiding detection, although this strategy ultimately didn't succeed in 2017. Indeed, on 10 November 2017, Fritz and his accomplices coordinate their activities remotely from a flat in Rotterdam with the extraction team operating in the port. One of the accomplices, who works as a painter at a port terminal in Rotterdam, borrows a friend's car and heads to the stack of containers, a place where he has no valid reason to be. The aim is to transport packets of white powder, representing around 170 kilo, to a nearby warehouse. However, the police operation is already underway, and the suspects are finally arrested in the warehouse. Fritz's team, trying to continue coordinating activities from a distance, leave the flat one by one, after receiving no further response from the warehouse team, it seems that Fritz calls one of his daughters to tell her that he won't be contactable for a while because things aren't going well. This suggests that he is anticipating the possibility of being arrested very soon. One of the most striking aspects of this case is also the presence of Naima, who is observed on several occasions by police surveillance teams during the same period in the company of Pete Costa and Fritz, among others, in a pancake shop. It is surprising that she has been appearing for years, albeit always on the fringes of various investigations, but never as the main suspect. That same year, 2017, the TCI receives information concerning her. Moroccan Naima, originally from Utrecht, has worked in the cocaine trade for years. Finally, in 2018, the Public Prosecutor's Office opens an investigation into Naima's involvement in the world of drugs, mainly because it appears that she is looking to establish new shipping lines and, on a large scale. However, her journey remains uncertain. How did she end up in this underworld? It is worth noting, though, that she is one of the few women who managed to reach such heights. However, some members of the milieu question her status and see her mainly as a pawn, acting as an intermediary rather than the real decision-maker. According to an unconfirmed article published by the newspaper Het Parul, she brought in far more investors than the number of kilos available and then ensured that the shipments were intercepted. Once the investors were informed of the failure, as seizures are a common risk in the trade, Naima would have pocketed the surplus of the invested funds. Whatever the case, one thing is clear, she is involved in many stories and, above all, conflicts. For example, 
During this period, everyone remembers the agitation in the milieu, particularly in Utrecht in the Netherlands, under the reign of the group around Ridwan Tahi, which was in conflict, among others, with the Moose group. One of his allies, Khalid, nicknamed Imo, narrowly escaped an assassination attempt, which unfortunately cost the life of an innocent man. Immediately after the attack, Imo is said to have established contact with an aunt, who, according to the investigators, is indeed Naima. These rather emotional conversations highlight the importance of the aunt in the eyes of certain people. According to sources in the milieu, several groups are hunting her down. In October 2019, Naima underwent gastric bypass surgery, a major stomach operation, after which she required constant care. Nevertheless, she decides to leave Spain on 19th October, and according to the courts, the aunt was taken to Amsterdam by someone using a Mercedes AMG. The following day, she is walking near her luxury flat in a business district when, at around 9.30 p.m., the surveillance cameras record her getting into a dark-colored Volkswagen Polo and driving away. This is the last sign of life left by Naima. Apparently, a few weeks before her disappearance, Naima becomes increasingly agitated and particularly suspicious. However, her family and close friends have no idea what is going on, as she has always kept her family firmly away from her business activities. What is even more remarkable is that one day after her disappearance, on 21st October, a home linked to her in Amsterdam appears to have been completely emptied. Her personal belongings, including family photos, were found in a skip. In addition, no ransom has been demanded. A new element is added to the case when the police raid Ridwan Tahi's flat in Dubai in December 2019. Police find an encrypted phone nearby. The phone contains sensitive photos of a tortured naked woman whom the police suspect of being the aunt in question. The photos show that they were taken on the night of 20 to 21st October 2019, the day after Naima disappeared. However, it is important to note that these photos seem to have been circulating in the milieu for some time and had been exchanged between various criminals. Although investigators are convinced that it is Naima, there is still no official confirmation of her death. The next twist comes in March 2021, when, as part of the investigation into the disappearance of the aunt, a thorough search is carried out in a warehouse in the port area of Antwerp. Clothes and a handbag are found under the floor of the hangar, but no trace of Naima's DNA is found, although investigators believe that the traces could have been erased. The choice of this warehouse is not insignificant, as it is linked to the network of the man nicknamed Bole Joss, who may have been involved in Naima's case. To simplify the story, Bole Joss found himself at the heart of a huge affair involving a gang from Luik in international drug trafficking. In this case, a discussion takes place between an individual named El Prez and Tito. It is quite clear that El Prez, or better said El Presidente, is a pseudonym often used, as far as Bolajos is concerned, to communicate via encrypted telephones. In a discussion at the end of April 2020, El Prez asks for news of the localization of a polo, to which Tito replied that the car had been cut up and scrapped, as he had been asked to do six months earlier. What's interesting is that the six-month period coincides with the disappearance of Naima, who happened to get into a VW Polo. Although Bola Joss was acquitted in June 2023 for lack of sufficient evidence of his involvement in the Belgian case, questions remain about this encrypted conversation. It is difficult to determine the exact reason for Naima's disappearance. There are several possible scenarios. Either she may have been responsible for a failed transport or she may have been too greedy and stolen drugs from other organizations, or her own group may have been playing a double game. One thing is certain, her disappearance remains a great mystery, and the circumstances surrounding the case are still unclear.